Good evening. My name is David Novaka. Justin Timberlake and Madonna said we only had four minutes to save the world. I'm going to have to do it in seven. But saving the world is actually the wrong way to think about acting on climate change. It's great for headlines, galvanizes commitment, but it has done precious little to date, unfortunately, to change the climate path we are on. Let me explain it another way. That renowned political sage, Robin Williams, does a stand-up routine where he tells the story of YouTube's Bono, somebody who probably is actually trying to save the uh, world. He's at a concert exhorting the crowd, saying, every time I clap my hands, a child in Africa dies. Playing a drunken Scot, Robin Williams yells out, then stop clapping your hands. Imagine that. Let's just stop climate change. It's as simple as that. Stop doing one thing, carbon polluting, and other things, climate change will not happen. Amusing as it might be, my Robin Williams metaphor actually illustrates the way too many people still think about this issue. It does two things wrong, in my view. First, it raises unreasonable and unachievable expectations of what should and can be done. Second, it distracts our focus from the enormous heavy lifting required to actually make real progress on arresting climate change. Since we're in political Ottawa tonight, let me put it in terms this crowd might appreciate it. To conservatives, the problem of climate change action is that it is led by environmentalists. To liberals, the problem of climate change action is that they're afraid it will be led by economists. One is too optimistic, the other too pessimistic. Utopia meet dystopia. But there's actually something quite revealing to me about all this. You cannot talk about the environment without also talking about the economy. And you cannot talk about the economy today without talking about the environment. What a heretical thought. Imagine, I remember a government agency, a national roundtable even, that used to do just that. But the climate change debate has radically polarized that radically simple, inescapable fact. You can have the environment and the economy, but not both. We are hectored from opposing sides. Now this zero-sum calculus leads to a winner-takes-all narrative that closes off progress on climate action, because anything that still produces carbon tomorrow is evil, for one view, and anything that stops producing carbon tomorrow is unrealistic for the other. Frankly, this is just plain wrong. It is not one or the other, or even one above the other. If we're going to make progress, it has to be one and the other. Canada's economy, like the world's, is a mostly fossil fuel economy. A century or more of oil and gas powering where we work, live, and play is not disappearing overnight. It's not that we in Canada are inured to the prospects of climate change but we are incredibly embedded with what we have now. When the vast majority of us think only of energy and electricity when we slip on a light switch or gas up at the pump, we just assume it's there anytime we want it. When you have a job, income, and standard quality of life based on a current energy economy model, that works for you and your family. It's no easy task to shift attitudes by saying to someone, how you live is wrong. In fact, it's virtually impossible. The reality is that climate action is going to have to coexist, however uneasily, with our current fossil fuel and carbon economy for some decades to come. The climate change operates at the nexus of three competing dynamics, protecting our environment, sustaining our economy, and producing and using energy. How successfully we integrate these three will determine how much progress we make as a country, society, and a planet on dealing with the threat of climate change. Can this be done? Yes. Emphatically, yes. Can this be done easily? Nope. Not a chance. Can this be done in time? Honestly, I have no bloody idea. We are told, and I firmly believe, that anthropogenic climate change is real. But it's equally real that we're going to be using carbon polluting energy sources for some time in the foreseeable future, far more than any other alternative to take up the slack. Now, this is no Western industrialized economic phenomenon. China is now the world's biggest carbon polluter, eclipsing the US and Europe by far. India, Brazil, Indonesia, all growing economies, and all in the top 10 carbon polluters. For the world's poor, cheap, accessible energy, and that means coal or oil and gas for many, is key to being lifted out of poverty. Broad-based economic growth is critical to meeting the World Bank's 2030 goal of ending extreme poverty. Yet, that same economic growth, fueled by population increases and energy production and use, 
that leads to more carbon pollution. Climate change sits uneasily at the confluence of these competing goals and desires. Its impacts will both foster economic dislocation and distress through rising sea levels, droughts, and floods, and its mitigation will in part stunt current economic growth and poverty reduction pathways for those who need it most. Here in Canada, our energy economy, oil sands and all, is a key contributor to our own wealth and standard of living. Oil and gas represented 10% of our GDP, almost 200,000 jobs, and accounted for fully one quarter of all our exports in 2011. About 30% of Alberta's revenues come from this one source. Looking pan Canadian lines, it contributes to our fiscal transfer network, financing indirectly healthcare in my home province of New Brunswick, and providing jobs for many people who can't find gainful employment where they live. Now, these are big numbers, meaningful numbers. Trouble is, every sector of the economy says it has a similar story to tell. Never mind that virtually every climate economy study shows that climate action through carbon constraint doesn't tank the economy. Canada actually has had some experience in dealing with this type of political and policy dialectic. No, I don't mean the Acid Rain Treaty. I mean the Canada-US Free Trade Agreement, that treaty. Predictions abounded then that our water, culture, manufacturing, fishing, farm, and dairy sectors would all be subsumed by those rapacious Americans. It didn't happen. And he said predictions, especially how many charged political ones can mostly come unglued. But that's not the point. The point is that we recognize there were economic consequences, but for the greater economic and social good, free trade was necessary, and we would work to mitigate the negative impacts. We did so with a major national adjustment program aimed at vulnerable economic sectors and communities. I see, frankly, no reason why a similar, rational, and realistic approach cannot be applied to climate change policy in Canada, too. Actually, I don't see how we can proceed with real policy action without it. Often the biggest threats in our minds are the ones we don't see. To cite climate philosopher Dale Jameson, there's no ethical or moral tradition against emitting colorless, odorless, tasteless gases into the atmosphere. That means, frankly, we're all a bit at sea in how we deal with this issue. It is a singularly tough, complex, intergenerational problem that defies easy answers. Yet, as I stated at the outset, we sometimes persist in giving just that, easy answers. Stop burning carbon, keep the oil sands on the ground, slap a carbon tax on everything, build more windmills. Then we hear from the other side. Jobs will be lost, the economy will collapse, the science isn't settled, don't act unless everyone else does. There seems little to reconcile between these two worldviews. And meanwhile, progress stalls. When it comes to acting on climate change, I submit that there are only two words that really matter. Time and transition. How much time will we need to transition to a sustainable, low-carbon economy that arrests future climate change? Once you accept that it will be a transition, not a U-turn, and that this will take time, then policy choices that can find acceptance in our economy and our environment and our society today can be implemented. That means making progress on everything that works. Not one big thing at first, but perhaps a policy dim sum, if you will, of many little things as we trans transition to implementing the big thing that matters, a low carbon economy. But listen to that, an viral economic vision, together, as one. So, what's hindering even that? Well, consider this final, simple, inescapable fact. The climate cycle, sadly, doesn't match the electoral cycle. Politicians are essentially told they must real, uh, that they must risk real votes today for the more ephemeral benefits of less climate change tomorrow. Something like this. So why are we surprised that more don't jump at this golden opportunity? But here's the whole changing thing, as that other climate philosopher Sarah Palin would have said, if she's thought that deep. What's controversial today is conventional wisdom tomorrow. So let me finish with another visual. You may think it is cheerfully cynical, but I think it's actually hopelessly realistic. So, a final question for all of you now. Does it matter how we get there, or just that we do? Thanks for listening.